Thank you very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, a year since Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso formed their own defence pact and the AES confederations moved to launch new biometric passports and its own media platform. Also, a slick operation. An oil refinery in Nigeria that could be a game changer has finally started supplying fuel to local petrol-starved markets in Africa's biggest oil producer. And we head to Benin for a peek at a new musical dedicated to unveiling episodes of history that many fear have been forgotten. A new musical dedicated to spotlighting a king pivotal to history. The throne of Behanzin tells the story of a king's battle for power, his country, and his eventual exile by colonial forces. But first, U.S. soldiers have finished their withdrawal from Niger. Washington's confirmed that the more than 1,000 troops that had been stationed there as part of a Sahelian anti-terror mission have pulled out, as agreed, with Niamey's military government. Now, the drawdown began in May after Niger abruptly ended a military agreement with the U.S. Niger's taken the lead on its own security against a insurgency and its own neighbouring agreements with Mali and Burkina Faso, having broken away together from regional bloc ECOWAS a year ago to form their own AES confederation. Now, Mali said that the nation's plan on launching new biometric passports soon, and the Allies are also consolidating their influence with a new AES media platform. Our team tells us more. Lanji Bama Yakuba used to head up an investigative newspaper in Burkina Faso. After the September 2022 coup there, press freedoms eroded quickly. Threats against him multiplied, and he escaped the country last year. They threw a Molotov cocktail into my house and burned my car. This was followed with threats online and by phone. Another important escalation was in November 2023 when I saw my name on a list of people accused of being enemies of Burkina Faso and who were to be sent to the border. Media access has declined regionally. In 2023, junta-led neighbours Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger closed ranks and signed the Alliance of Sahel States, or AES, Defence Pact. Journalists have increasingly come under attack and dozens have fled. Around 20 media outlets have been closed down and most foreign media suspended. Now, the AES is launching its own broadcasting project, Web TV. This propaganda approach is nothing less than mystification, accompanied by a pseudo-revolutionary theme that only serves the will to stay in power as long as possible. Details are still hazy, but Web TV will reportedly focus on reaching audiences online and via social media, where pro AES accounts are already strong. Some Burkina Bears are worried the platform might exacerbate the harassment of those who question the AES. Through social media networks today, when you give a point of view that differs from that of some Burkina Bays, you're either called stateless or you're threatened in messages. Even your family can be threatened. The control of information is an important tool for the Alliance. It has a lot to prove after turning away from its Western allies who have been helping tackle insurgencies. The jihadists continue to ramp up the violence. Last month, at least 400 people were killed in Burkina Faso's deadliest ever attack. Well, Angolan mediators are still pushing to defuse tensions between DR Congo and Rwanda. They have made some headway in unpicking the rivalries and mistrust behind the three-year M23 insurgency in DR Congo's east. By, but implementing what's agreed in the negotiating room on the ground will be tough. Emmett Livingston brings us more from DR Congo. On Saturday, diplomatic delegations from DR Congo and Rwanda were in Angola's capital, Luanda, to discuss a possible resolution to the M23 conflict. M23 rebels, backed by Rwanda, launched a rebellion in eastern Congo in late 2021 and seized swathes of territory. The so-called Luanda peace process, spearheaded by Angola, has attempted to defuse the crisis for years without much success. 
but a new Congolese government breathed new life into the initiative. Current discussions revolve around the withdrawal of the FDLR militia from eastern Congo, according to several officials. The FDLR originates from Rwandan Hutu extremists whose leaders were instrumental in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. The group now supports the Congolese army. Rwanda's priority is to extinguish the FDLR. And on the Congolese side, the priority is the removal of Rwandan troops from eastern Congo. Revived diplomatic talks, as well as a tenuous ceasefire between the M23 and the Congolese army, has sparked hope in the troubled region. However, over the past several years, ceasefires and talks have often failed. Around 1.7 million people have been displaced by the M23 conflict, many of whom are living in unimaginably dire conditions. Well, amidst the chaos of weeks of flooding, 281 Nigerian prisoners have escaped in Maiduguri in the country's northeast. A dam collapse last week unleashed walls of water that killed 30 and displaced over a million people in the city. The deluge also brought down a wall at the main prison, allowing inmates to just walk out. Seven have since reportedly been recaptured and police are still trying to track down the rest of the escapees. And an oil refinery in Nigeria that could be a game changer to the country has started supplying f fuel to local markets. Nigeria is Africa's biggest oil producer, but is also crippled by fuel shortages as it has extremely limited capacity to process fuel for its own use. After a few full starts, though, the huge Dangote refinery, backed by one of the country's richest men, has started selling to the state oil firm. Our Sam Olakoya brings us more. After several decades, Nigeria has once again returned to refining its petrol locally. Although Nigeria is Africa's largest crude oil exporter, it has been importing its petrol because the four government-owned refineries are not functioning. Now the privately-owned Dangote refinery, the largest single-train refinery in the world, has come to supply the Nigerian market with petrol. Nigeria's reliance on imported petrol has caused frequent scarcity of the product, leading to long queues of motorists at pump stations. Even when available, the imported petrol can be very expensive, selling beyond what many Nigerians can afford. The price of petrol has of recent gone so high that government workers in some states have been asked to work from home. This is to reduce the hardship they face with transportation. In Edo State, the resumption of schools has been postponed indefinitely due to the high price of petrol. Nigerians hope that supply from the Dangote refinery will solve the protracted problem of petrol scarcity. They also hope that the price of the product will come down. But in a country where vested interest frustrated the government's own refineries from operating so that the lucrative business of imported petrol can thrive, some Nigerians say the Dangote refinery must be mindful of these interest groups if it must succeed where four government-owned refineries failed. Sam Olakoya there for us. Now, South Sudanese people have been coming to terms with the recent shock news that promised national elections have been pushed back by two years. The government made that announcement on Friday that the polls would be rescheduled until December 2026. Another sign of the difficulties that the world's youngest country is facing in trying to overcome the fallout of years of brutal conflict. I, our, uh, our regional correspondent tells us more. Since the news broke out last Friday, social media has been buzzing with reactions from South Sudanese. Many have expressed their anger and frustration. They had been very excited about voting in the country's first ever election. And a lot of them say they no longer trust the government, as this is the second time the elections have been postponed. They were initially supposed to be held in February 2023. So many have said that political leaders are trying to cling on to power in the oil-rich nation. However, others have been expressing their relief. They had been concerned that the election in December could have led to even more violence and instability in uh, South Sudan. President Salva Kiir's office has said that the election cannot take place until a new constitution is finalized. Officials have also cited logistical and security concerns, which apparently could not be resolved before December. South Sudan gained its independence in 2013, making it the world's youngest nation. 
However, just two years later, the country plunged into a violent civil war between President Salva Kiir and a Vice President Riek Mashar's rival forces. In that conflict, 400,000 people were killed and millions were displaced. In 2018, an agreement was finally signed and in that deal, a promise that elections would be held was made. However, six years later, that promise has still not been fulfilled. Livia Bizo there for us. And now we head to Benin, where a new musical dedicated to spotlighting a king pivotal to the country's history has opened to audiences. The throne of Behanzin tells the story of a king, king's rise to power, his battle for his country, and eventual exile to Martinique by colonial France. Our team went for a peek. The cast of this rare Beninese musical pour their hearts into passionately bringing the story of the greatest ruler of the historical kingdom of Dahomey to life. Playing Beyonzin in a musical is a great honor for me, and it's a pleasure as well. It comes with a lot of responsibility, but we've committed ourselves to this and we've worked hard for it. Dahomey existed from about 1600 to 1904. Its 11th king, Beyonzin, ruled from 1889, but outside of Benin, few know about his courageous fight against French colonization. In order for our story to be accessible to everyone and easy to share and enjoy, we need to demystify it. Certainly not everything should be publicly disclosed, but I believe we need to share the vibrant revolutionary thoughts and the pride of Dahomey. The idea came from a fairly simple observation. Benin is rich in many treasures rooted in our culture and heritage. Unfortunately, we haven't taken full advantage of these riches. Films like Woman King and even Black Panther draw a lot from our history. In any case, Hollywood in general makes a significant amount of money from our culture, and ultimately, Benin does not benefit from it directly. The musical is called The Throne of Beyonce and features many historical figures, such as the progressive king Adam Dozan and the Agoji, a group of women who chose to forego love and dedicate their lives to the kingdom. I'm very proud and very happy as a female choreographer to be able to once again reveal the story of the Amazons through the history of our revered King Behanza. The musical is a first for Benin and has gone down well with audiences here. Producers plan to take the show on an international tour next year. The show plays an important part in Benin's soft power push as it tries to attract more visitors to the country by promoting its rich cultural heritage. Wow, that looks amazing. I hope I get a chance to catch that. Well, though, well, that is all the time we have for Eye on Africa. Thanks very much for joining us. And do so again if you can. Till then, take care.